four minutes past nine. I was just saying to Chris, my producer, the other day, there's nothing I like better than a vegan phone-in. And often, I have to admit, if I ever stand in for Matt Fry, I usually do that as one of the hours if there's a news hook for it, because I'm absolutely fascinated by um, why people turn vegan, less so vegetarian in some ways, because I think it's quite a radical step to go vegan. And what people always tell me is that, well, it's necessary to eat less meat. Now, as a meat eater myself, I think I have actually over the last few years started to eat less meat, not necessarily deliberately so. I just think my my diet has widened a little bit. Um, but I was interested in this study today uh, from Oxford University where they pinpoint the difference high and low meat diets have of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, they, they basically say that if you cut it out of your diet completely or at least partially, it would be like taking 8 million cars off the road. I mean, that's assuming that we all did it, which clearly is not, is not going to happen. So, it, in a way, it's a bit of a pointless exercise. But I wonder how many of us are actually really aware of the amount of greenhouse gases that are caused by meat eating. I mean, it, 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 in some ways, it doesn't compute, does it? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that over the course of the next hour. Now, the Professor Peter Scarborough of Oxford, who led the new research, said, Our results show that if everyone in the UK who is a big meat eater reduced the amount of meat they ate, it would make a really big difference. You don't need to completely eradicate meat from your diet, he said. Now, they surveyed 55,000 people who were divided into big meat eaters who ate more than 100 grams of meat a day, which equates to a big burger, uh, low meat eaters whose daily intake was 50 grams or less, approximately a couple of chipolata sausages, fish eaters, vegetarians and vegans. Um, that Under that, I'm not a big meat eater. I don't eat 100, 100 grams of meat a day, I, I don't think. So I'm feeling now very virtuous in some ways. But what I really want to ask, I mean, if you want to talk about whether you believe this study or not, absolutely fine. But I actually want to talk about you. And if you have cut meat um, either out of your diet completely or partially out of your diet, what effect has that had on your health? Because I've always gone from the point of view that um, we, we are kind of trained to be meat eaters. It's a natural human thing to do. And I've always thought that a balanced diet, which includes meat, is probably the healthiest. In the, again, I've always thought that a vegan diet cannot possibly be healthy. But every time I talk to vegans on the radio, they, they try and convince me, and they're actually quite convincing, I have to say, they try and convince me that they're right and I'm wrong. And that just because you cut meat and dairy products out of your diet, that doesn't mean to say it's not a healthy diet. Well, have another go at convincing me if you like. So if you've cut meat out of your diet or even just reduced how much you eat, what was your reason for doing so? What impact has it had on your health? 0345 6060 973. Uh, Richard McIlwain joins us, Chief Executive of the Vegetarian Society. Um, Richard, very good evening. I, I suppose vegans are like the provisional wing of the Vegetarian Society, are they? Hello, Ian. Hi. Well, you might argue that, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we've been around doing what we do since uh, 1847. I mean, not me personally, obviously I'm not that old, but the organisation has. And it's always been a broad church of vegetarians and vegans um, with some healthy debate going on, as you might imagine, over, over, over many years. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, from my point of view, really whether you're vegetarian or vegan, as this study shows, you know, you are making a, a considerable difference, particularly on things like climate, compared to uh, meat eaters. And it's interesting you talk about the high, medium and low. The, the reality is, of course, that many people are eating far too much meat. We consume far too much protein every day. So you'll probably find the majority of people are falling into that medium or high category rather than the low. So what are... What what are the dangers? And and just explain to me a little bit more why meat eating creates so much greenhouse, so many greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, well, it's it's animal agriculture itself takes up about one third of all the habitable land um, on Earth. Um, most of that is to grazing, cattle grazing, 
obviously pigs, poultry, etc., take up far less land. And the reality is cattle are, you know, they are ruminants. They, they have four stomachs. That's so that they can ferment and break down tough grasses, which we, of course, can't eat directly. Um, and that releases uh, methane as part of that. So they are belching methane. And that's, you know, that's a substantial part of the overall emissions. And then there's the land use clearances that happen for cattle grazing. So you're taking down, um, you know, uh, tropical woodlands, particularly in South America, for instance, um, which are sequestering carbon, you know, are storing carbon. You clear those, you, you release all that carbon to the atmosphere, and you put cattle on that land. And so you lose the benefit of that land's previous use as woodland as well. So those two things together, belching cattle and um, deforestation for cattle grazing, are, are really what are behind most of the greenhouse gas emissions that get reported. But, I mean, in terms of... Uh, climate change how mm. what, what proportion do these greenhouse gases as a result of cows and whatever what 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 proportion do they uh take up so overall animal agriculture is estimated you pick your survey 14 and a half percent of of overall greenhouse gas emissions gets estimated some studies say 16 some are now quoting 18 percent um so really along with fossil fuels the way that we use land, and really that's shorthand for animal agriculture, and our dependence on fossil fuels, not just for energy, but for everything we use, plastics and all these things, are really the two, I would like to say, the two primary things that are, are driving uh, climate change. And that, you know, the, the focus absolutely, quite rightly, on fossil fuels, but I think now increasingly also on a smaller component, but, but very important component, which is animal agriculture. Um, Namely, because it's actually, <laughs> bizarrely, very easy to change. You know, changing someone's diet, particularly in a, in a still relatively wealthy uh, economic country like the UK, is actually very straightforward. We just need to try and inspire and incentivize well, more people to do it. The theory is straightforward. You're absolutely right. The practice is less straightforward. I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to imagine my eating habits without any meat and. Even though I, I sometimes I do have sometimes, and I speak as the son of a farmer, so I, mm. traditionally, I mean that that was all always part. I mean, my mother would sort of probably have had a heart attack if I'd said, "Oh, I'm turning vegetarian." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you don't particularly like many vegetables, which I don't, um, you're a bit stuck, aren't you? Even even if you just decide that it is the right thing to do to eat less meat. But because of your other dislikes in vegetables or, or even fish or anything else, um, it, it, it's quite a challenge for some of us. It is quite a challenge. And, and I think, you know, we, we grew up as children, don't we, being, being force-fed our vegetables almost, um, when the reality is, you know, most guidelines that are coming out from the UK and globally are suggesting that actually half our plates when we sit down to eat should be full of vegetables. That's, that's what really constitutes a healthy diet. Um, but you say, you know, what, what do we eat? I mean, there's a very traditional vegetarian foods, um, tofu. People have very bad experiences with tofu, but if you have good tofu... It's fantastic. There's lots of um, soya um, proteins that are out there. Corn has been around for a long time, since the 90s. A lot of people uh, enjoy eating that. Grains, pulses, lentils, obviously been around. Nice shepherd's pie with lentils, all fantastic stuff and quite traditional. But I think increasingly, and particularly we find this with younger people now, because you know vegans and vegetarians tend to have a younger age range, they're growing up in a climate where the plant-based aisle in a supermarket has always been a thing for them. Of course, for you and I, it wasn't. Five, six years ago, there was no such thing. And you can now get a range of what are very familiar foods, whether it's burgers or sausages or kebab pieces, whatever it might be. Um, and so you don't actually have to shift to a diet which feels completely alien. You can ease yourself into it, have foods that are familiar, and then maybe go, what we find, actually, and we find this, you know, we run a campaign called National Vegetarian Week. We had 17,000 people participating this year. 97% of those people said, you know, as a result of just trying it, we're going to go on and try a little bit more. And that's what we find. Once people well, take that first step, they go further. I have tried some things. I, I tried um, vegan cheese, and it was disgusting. Um, I tried vegan Magnum ice creams. Now that 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 was sort of more acceptable, but it was still it was a pale imitation of a real one. 
Um, I, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for the vegan magnet, I have to say. Um, but, you know, you're right on, on vegan cheese. I think most people would say it's it's not there yet. Some some brands are better than others, but um, there's still work to do there. But that's the exciting part. You know, I always like to say to people, we are on the... Cu- I, I genuinely believe, and lots of people believe, we are on the cusp of a food transition. We've got this big climate crisis um, the way we use our land and the way we farm animals is in, is one of the major drivers of it. Uh, and that's why billions are being poured into new foods. You know, we're looking at just in the US two weeks ago, cultivated meat. That is meat grown in a lab Ooh. from animal cells Ooh. was, um, Ooh, was no. uh, released onto the market. No, I don't want to eat that. Don't want to eat that. This is a funny thing, isn't it, though? Because you, you, you'll eat meat that's sort of gone through an abattoir, which I think most people would agree. Yeah, but it is, uh, it's still natural process. meat, though. Because, uh, I mean, food security is obviously very important. And my, my fear, if you, if you allow labs to sort of grow meat like that, I mean, that, that would be manna from heaven for people who wanted to basically kill a lot of people and put poison in them somehow. Oh, I think you'd, you'd have to look at the food standards agencies in the US and the UK. I mean, arguably, you could do that now, couldn't you, with all the processed foods that are on the market? I mean, if anybody wanted to, to wipe people oh, out, you true. know, that, that it's always there. So I think, you, you, I think you've got to look on it as, uh, you know, the proof will be of the pudding will be in the eating. You know, if you, if you have a, a cultivated meat burger and it tastes just like a beef burger, but it doesn't involve an animal being raised and, you know, let's face it, fairly brutally slaughtered, I would say to people, surely now the the, 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 the the ethics behind it and the reality of being able to avoid animal slaughter and still eat what you want means surely you're not going to require that animal to go through the abattoir. You know, there's a range of foods. It's not just cultivated meat. There's all the plant-based foods that are out there which replicate burgers and sausages. Brewing technology called fermentation now is producing some of the proteins you find in milk. And, you know, there's companies in the States now that are producing ice creams that, that effectively are much closer to the, the milk they're trying to replicate than maybe some of the plant-based sources. But I think all of this food will have a, pl- a role to play. You know, I, I think animal agriculture is with us for a while yet. You know, let's face it. it. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Take a while to wean people off meat. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that there's calls at sort of the, the COP summits for governments mm. to take action to curb uh, pollutants going into the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, and, and governments, to be fair, have done a lot of that. Well, our government has been very successful in doing that c- compared to others. But... I've yet to call, hear anyone dare to call for the extermination of all cattle throughout the world. Because if, if, if this argument is right, if your argument's right, that 15% of greenhouse gases are caused by cows, then surely the, the natural thing to do would be to say, well, if we want to make sure that temperatures don't go up as much as possible, well, 15% of these, we can get rid of them all if we just exterminate all cows in the world. Well, you'd have a phase transition, wouldn't you? I don't think I don't think there'd be any vegan who'd suggest, you know, let's go and exterminate lots of cows. I think what you will find in reality, as with most industries that go into some sort of decline, is you'd have a managed transition. So over time, you know, we are finding now people are meat consumption in the UK has dropped quite considerably over the last ten years. I think that trend will continue. The industry will just contract around that. So, you know, the average age of the UK farmer is nearly 60. So it's not a, it's not a young workforce. And I think you'll have new people coming in who may be open to, to, to farming land in a different way, maybe more open to crop farming, more open to rewilding. And I think in 30, 40 years, because I think that's probably the timeline we're talking here, but, you know, I, I'm not an advocate of saying we need to solve this tomorrow because it's not going to happen. But I do think we need to get ourselves on a on a pathway. And that's what's so frustrating about the UK given, as you say, in many ways they've been a leader. But we've got ourselves in a position where no politician worth a salt will stand at the ballot box and say, Do you know what? I think we need to eat a bit less meat because they sort of instinctively think it's a vote loser. Yeah. I actually think there's a broad swathe of the UK and not just young people. You know, there's people who are aged over sixty five. You look at some of the YouGov surveys who are saying, do you know what, about 40% of people over 65 are actively reducing their consumption of meat. So, you know, I think my job in leading the Vegetarian Society is to try to get politicians to a place where they feel quite comfortable standing up and saying to the British people, do you know what, I think we probably do need to eat a bit less meat. It's better for your health. That's been proved through through a number of studies. 
better for animals, it's better for climate, it's better for biodiversity. And you can eat, and, it, and it's not a hair share thing. You can eat a range of fantastic foods. I mean, you said yourself, you've been ex- expanding y- your, your diet range and reducing your meat, not necessarily for the reasons that I might um, advocate for, but other options are available. It's one of the huge benefits of living in the UK. You know, you can eat cuisines from all around the world. Yeah, no, which absolutely. Don't involve meat. Um, whenever I do this kind of subject, I always think I'm going to ha- have a row with the, the guest from uh, who's either vegan or vegetarian. But you are, you have been the voice of sweet reason, Richard. I can't even provoke myself.